uh, Subrata, Subrata Bhavamik um, from Ananda Mundir. And on, um, on behalf of Ananda Mundir, we are welcoming you to one of our regular sessions of Shahipto O Alochana, AKA Alochana. And it is um, Alochana. And before we get into the details of what we are discussing today and what we have done so far, but I wanted to say just a few words about what we do. Um, so I'll read from one of the one of the articles that I have to I actually um, contribute to to Anand Mundi's uh, publications, and the, the sh summary of that is: Shahito o Alochana is a monthly literary and topical discussion forum under the aegis of Ananda Mundir. It completed its 12th anniversary in January 2022 and has organized 124 sessions. These monthly sessions feature exciting and illuminating discussions on diverse subjects, including literature, art, theater and movie, history, philosophy and religion, science and mathematics, economics and business, social issues, sports, and current, current affairs. With that, I just wanted to talk about how it started. 12 years ago, um, Amitabhu Bakchi and I um, start, started this session, like this, this um, Alochana program with only three members, with only three members, and with the, the first topic was Manik Bandhapadhai, and that was back in 2008. From that, we have come a long way and we have completed, as I said, 124 sessions over the last uh, one, uh, 12 years. And it's, it's like, it's all very, very different. Uh, very, um, we, we do uh, discussion sessions on all kinds of subjects, a broad, broad range of subjects. A sampling of that would be, let's say poetry, prose, Poetry, we have done sessions on uh, Joy Goshami, Eliot, Yates, uh, Sulil Ganguly, Srijato, Urdu Adab. Prose, we have done sessions on Naipal, Garcia Marquez, Kazua, Ishugur, Kazua Ishiguro, Salman Rajdi, Nadin Gordonar, and Uruntuti Roy. Drama, we have done sessions on Bartle Brecht, Pint, Harold Pintas from Mumitro, and Ed Albi. Technology and science, we have done sessions on artificial intelligence and other ast astrophysics uh, you know, issues. Medicines, uh, medicine and psychiatry, we have done um, sessions on 200 years of discoveries and new frontiers in uh, medicine. We have done sessions on myths of, myths of mental illness. And finally, we have done a very successful session on pandemic of the, um, the recent pandemic, COVID-19. Philosophy, we have done sessions on Gita, Atma in different uh, religions, religions, uh, religion versus evolution, and other, of course, we, we have done sessions on digital currencies, economics, including India and China comparison, and um, you know, trade. Another example would be trade, tariff, and um, and Trump um, trade, excuse me, trade tariff and Trump triune myths of um, make America great again. So this actually summarizes how diverse we are in terms of choosing the subject, choosing the speakers and so on. So this is actually, um, with that, I would like to say, this is a community service from Ananda Mundir and we have done that so far without with, without any support, financial support from Ananda, from either from Ananda Mundir or from the participants. But we would still like to encourage our audiences and participants, uh, participants, if you can, please make a donation to Ananda Mundir. You could do it um, by contacting me, or you could just do it just anonymously, or or whatever the uh, ways that you choose to do it. But just just think about that. Like, you know, we have been doing it for 12 years. We have done so many um, um, sessions on diverse subjects, and we would like to continue it for another 12 years. I may not be 
the the, the leader, but somebody else will take um, take it on. So um, again, I urge you to make a donation so that we are able financially solid and able to able to continue this uh, these sessions. So with that, I would come back to today's session. Today's session is um, I will take a minute to write a few lines, to read a few lines about today's session. And that is, yep. Excuse me um, um, for being a little disorganized. And this is this is actually our session and we are we know each other. So we think we, we should be okay. So um, as I said, over the last 12 years, we brought to, brought to you, meaning the audience here and the regular attendees, many interesting and intellectually stimulating sessions on varied and eclectic topics covering a broad range of subjects. And we trotted across the global boundaries, ran the whole gamut of human consciousness, hunting for ideas. But what we needed to do more often is to embark on a treasure hunt in our own backyard. And I'm sure if we had done that, we would have discovered more, many more creative genius gems amongst us. Remember, Ebongo, Bhandare Tabu, Bibidho Raton. I'm also reminded of the famous lines penned by Tagore, Dekha hoi nai shudhu chokhu melia, ghar hote shudhu dui pa felia, in today's session, we are going to do just that, rediscover and enjoy the beauty of those glistening drops of dew on the sheaves of paddy grain that lie in our doorsteps. So with that summary, what we'd like to do is we'd like to talk a little bit about the format of today's session. We have four creative writers here and the uh, sequence we will follow is that we'll start with Tathagatu Ghosh, then we'll move to Joystri Chatterjee, then we'll move to Vishnu Priya, and finally Amitabhu Bakchi, who is a co-founder and co-manager of this, uh, of this um, you know, uh, program. Um, so with that, I, the, the format will be, I would take a minute to introduce the writer and then the writer will present, will read his or her own writing for 15 to 20 minutes. And that would be followed up by a five to 10 minutes max, a, a Q and A session. If you have any questions that pertains, uh, pertain to that particular piece of writing. Um, and we'll go into this order. And finally, at the end of the session, if you have more questions, we, if we have enough time, we can we we can address them at the um, at the end of the session. The way we will pick up your questions will be if you if you were on Facebook Live, preferably you should be on Facebook Live. You can if you, you can write your um, comments on the comment box and we'll pick it up from there. We may or may not be able to address all the questions uh, given the time limits uh, of each session but we would try our best to address all of most of your questions. With that, with that I would like to introduce Tathagata Ghosh. Um, um, Tathagata Ghosh and um, Tathagata, I have to unmute you. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Hi, um, about a few words about Tathagata. Tathagata is, uh, Tathagata Ghosh published his first book of short stories last year, titled Soaring Crimson Tales. He's an IT professional currently in the healthcare industry and an avid sports person. Spent his childhood in Chennai and many of his stories have their roots in the place that he grew up in. The story of Blood Red and Black draws on elements of childhood and politics during a tumultuous, tumultuous time in Chennai. This is, this is what 
Tathagato would like to be introduced, but I would like to add my own color. I can tell you, I have read many short stories written by him. And once I get those short stories, I cannot drop them until I finish them. With that, Tathagato, the mic is to you. <laughs> Thank you, Shubhroto. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Hello, everybody. Good evening. This is my book, and I'm going to read from that. The name of the story is Blood Red and Black. And I encourage you to ask me questions at the end of it. Love to answer any question that you may have. Blood Red and Black. Unlike all the houses on my street, house number 101, Second Canal Cross Street, remain silent and vacant. It was a bungalow like all the rest of the houses on the street. We lived in Chennai, formerly known as Madras, and all the houses on our street had huge gardens with mango, guava, and neem trees. Most of the houses had mature coconut trees towering over double-story houses in that area, and we would climb them. Well, halfway at least. We had guava, jackfruit, and mang mango trees too, those were easier to negotiate. The mango trees had sturdy branches going every which way and were perfect for climbing. I was about 10, so were my friends, and we climbed trees all the time because of the great views, the fruits, and because, of course, we had no TVs. There were garden lizards everywhere in our compounds, keeping company with the squirrels and the annoying black crows. The lizards were also known as bloodsuckers because the male garden lizard would develop a flaming red coloration around the throat during mating season. That was enough reason for us to throw stones at them. They tried to hide from us while we compound hopped and climbed trees, but we still got a few of those bloodsuckers. Whose blood were they sucking, we wondered. The garden lizards were safe if they made their way to house number 101. There, they scampered up the trees and were relatively safe from us because we were too scared to enter the yard. It was not always like that. Before house number 101 stood forlorn and empty, there was an older couple who lived there. Their children had probably moved to other cities and this older couple was not particularly friendly to us. There was a maid in her 20s who worked there for long hours. In the somnolent afternoons, we often saw a young guy dropping in. The mommies, the housewives, were somewhat scandalized. The household was asleep. Why was this fellow hanging around with the young maid in the mid-afternoons? The young maid was probably having an affair, always straying if they did not have enough housework. One hazy summer afternoon, there was a commotion at number 101. We ran there and stood with the other gawkers. There were lots of police milling around. They were a self-important bunch and blocked off the entrance to the house. A police vehicle waited on the street, its paint fading. The driver had fallen asleep. Yanachi, what happened? I asked with a, a tinge of insolence to a couple of police officers. They were holding lathis, their hard wooden crunchions, guarding the outside of the house. Five of us kids had gathered. A few more were on the way, all of us small and pesky barefoot and in shorts. The policemen looked underfed but officious and waved their menacing lattes at us. Yanna Achi, the mommy from the house opposite to my house, also had come. It was the afternoon, so not many mommies were up and about. Mostly it was us kids wandering the streets. Then there was activity from within the house and the police were bringing out a body on a stretcher, completely shrouded. They chased us away 
from the front of the gate. And then we saw a second stretcher come out. As they loaded the two bodies into the police van, everyone was now asking, Yenahachi. The maid and her paramour may have been overcome by the burden of their small, complicated world and did the wrong thing. They had committed suicide by hanging themselves. The family living in number 101 left soon after and Mr. Ramaprasad, who had rented the house, consulted his astrologer. The house needs to be purified. Keep the house locked for two years, four months and 24 days, said the astrologer. Do the requisite pujas every month and you can rent a place again, he assured Mr. Ram Prasad. Mr. Ram Prasad was a religious man and he followed the astrologer's advice and stopped renting the place. He owned many houses on the street, including the one we were renting, and it did not hurt him too badly to have one of them locked up for a little while. The silent, spooky house became a magnet drawing us and our imaginations towards its emptiness. We tiptoed in, always as a group, hoping the spirits did not notice us. We peeked over the overgrown gardens and peered through the windows to see if we could make out ethereal figures, ghosts, or any such creatures without, without putting ourselves in harm's way. Occasionally, somebody would yell, I see a ghost, or something moved. Immediately, all of us would scatter from the house, hurtling towards the gate. There would be a heated argument with some of us who were more cautious and would advise against going back. But the foolhardy amongst us normally prevailed. We would gingerly make our way back, but we never got to see anything. Except for the house lizards. I saw these house lizards before anyone else did. The front of the house was always in the shade because of the large mango trees in front of the compound. There were two fans in the room where the maid and her paramour had hung themselves. It was hard to make anything inside the house very clearly. But I saw the house lizards, pale and bloodless, motionless near the fans. We went round to the other rooms and peeked into the cracks through the windows. There were no house lizards anywhere else in the house. Just the two house lizards by the fence in the living room in front. A lot of mommies came up to me to ask, Yenna Achi, because they had heard that we were witnesses, eyewitnesses to the tragic turn of events. And we made up stories that wedded the lurid imaginations of the mommies. While we spun our tales and the mommies lapped it up. Another story was grabbing the headlines and shocking almost everyone else in Madras. The chief minister of Madras was C.N. Anadure, a charismatic script writer for the movies who had turned to politics. He was the head of the ruling party, the Dravida Munetra Karagam or DMK party. There had been rumors that he had cancer, had even visited the U.S. for cancer treatments. But he was back in India from the States soon after. He was again in the business of politicking when the cancer relapsed. Anadare was admitted to the Adyar Cancer Hospital, bordering our street. Anadare had checked in one weekend, and his followers, hundreds of them, weeping and praying, descended on our area once they got wind that Anadare was there. Anadure was the Anna, their big brother. And they, they had voted for him because they were devoted to him. The tearful and distraught people made themselves comfortable in our yard and other compounds all over the street. Swooning people, baking in the heat of, in Madras, asked for and gulped down glasses of water that we brought to them. These were people who had swore allegiance to their political benefactor, and his illness was as personal as the well-being of a family member. 
we resented this intrusion into our compounds and the houses and our, and our quiet neighborhood. The sense of foreboding, of sorrow and loss descended on us. There were red and black DMK flags all over the place. The DMK pe people also favored these colors for their clothes. It would be hard to catch me wearing those colors, I thought. It would make me look like a damn DMK guy. There were men, women, and kids, and everybody wailed. Ayo, Anna, Ayo, Anna. Whenever there was some terrible news that came out of the hospital, lots of them threatened to burn down the hospital if Anna died. We were worried. Our house, as I have mentioned, was across the street. Another was extremely popular and there was a genuine outpouring of grief. The party people, many of them poor and devoted, just hung around the hospital. The end was imminent, but they refused to believe it. Anna was their savior and they were go looking for a movie script ending. The cancer going into remission, the bad guys being taken to jail. In this case, the bad guys were the doctors. They were the ones giving the bad news. The cancer was relentless and spread. Anadure was on his deathbed. I had just fallen asleep when I suddenly woke to a tremendous wailing and sobbing in the middle of the night. We all realized that Anadure must have passed away. I was worried that the sadness might turn into violence and the hospital would be attacked. That night was a very long night, but by the morning, the wailing had subsided. I had just nodded off to sleep when the dawn was shattered by another series of sharp, dreadful, painful screams. The people who were in a stupor and dozing in our compound woke up, and so did all the people in the compounds all over the street. The screams but not from the hospital. There was a fire at house number 101. We rushed over, but the fire had been put out by the time we reached it. To our horror, we saw two blackened figures writhing on the grounds, a man and a woman, charred and burnt. The other people in the compound said that out of sheer grief, on learning of Anna's death, the man and woman had poured kerosene on themselves and lit a match. It was not clear whether they were married. The state was in mourning. Anadure's temporary successor had taken over, and soon enough, the political machinations had begun. A massive funeral was organized, so big that it made it into the Guinness Book of World Records as the biggest funeral ever at that time, with an estimated 15 million people present. Fortunately, nothing untoward happened to the hospital, and the followers of Anna melted away, leaving garbage and filth strewn around. House number 101 remained eerily empty, and the presence of death lingered long after the police did their job and everything was cleared out. We went back to peering into number 101 to check for ghosts. Again, it was me who spotted the lizards. The two house lizards seemed like they had remained frozen in place around the fence, probably a good place for their daily sustenance of insects. We were all somewhat convinced by now that the house lizards in the house were the spirits of dead folk. I was pretty sure that there would be two more house lizards now, inhabited by the spirits of the DMK couple who had immolated themselves. I climbed up to the windowsill and attempted to get a better view while the rest of the kids remained on the ground. I could see nothing except the two deathly white house lizards that had always been there. Suddenly, somebody screamed. 
and I looked down at my friends. I did not feel anything, but everyone was looking at my ankle. Blood dripped onto the ground from my bare feet. Over my friends' heads, sitting on the coconut tree, looking directly at me, I saw the two blood suckers with flaming red eyes and crimson throats. Their mouths were twitching as they screamed at me in silence. A red froth oozed from the mouths of the garden lizards, matching the blood dripping from my ankles. I distinctly remember their tails were red and speckled with black, like a DMK flag. Thank you. Thank you. Chubrata, I can't hear you. Myself, then I'll unmute all of you so at least we can talk amongst ourselves. I, I haven't seen any comments on the Facebook Live so far, but um, I'll just, I'm, try, I'm, read, I'm actually writing a comment on the Facebook Live. Um, so basically inviting people to um, to to uh, you know write their comments if they have any fascinating story by the way uh i hadn't heard it before thank you Odawata. imagery is is excellent in the balancing and bringing back the deaths the spirits and all of those yeah and i was um, wondering how it was going to end and the ending <laughs> it was really yeah. very i never thank thought that Happened. Yeah, I mean, we were thinking we'll end any time, but we didn't know exactly where. Yeah, I, I, I personally liked, you know, the um, integration of politics and bloodsuckers. The <laughs> 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 very interesting kind of a juxtaposition. <laughs> Detail, like a DMK flag. DMK flag. Well, we know Trinomul flag. I don't know DMK flag. Nah, me too. I didn't know. Black? All black? Black and red. Red and black. Red, red and, and black. black. Yeah. Red and black. Yeah. Yeah. How very blood suckerish. <laughs> <laughs> How very blood suckerish. Um, we waited for a few minutes. I don't see any comments yet. I see 10 people uh, viewing, but I don't see any, com don't see any comments here. So we've been... Hold on for a second. I think jo uh, Joy is calling me. Hello. Hello, Shunku. Hello. Hello. Hi, Ami. I was saying that Ami, you can make a comment. Could I just type it? You can text to make a just type it. It's not letting me. Facebook, Facebook Live, Live. We're basically inviting the people to post comment. Oh, you have to invite, the host has to invite uh -huh. to post comments, I see. Facebook? You have to do it on Facebook, I think. Well, let's see. Let me go to Facebook, just, just making sure. Okay, Facebook Live now, let's see. Should I? So you said that I should be on Facebook Live through on uh, Facebook or through on the Mandir? Hello? Yeah. Such a funny problem. Anyway, um, Tathagato, we will come back to your yeah, Q&A session. Yeah, um, sure. Fix it. Yes, because it, I think it's somehow not working. I see, I see people uh, listening to us, but I don't see any comments. I wanted to type, I think, type something, uh, inviting them to make comments, but I couldn't do. It. But anyway, let's move on. Yeah. And um, so, um, to the uh, to the audience, if you have any questions or any any comments on. Tathagato's um, short story reading, please save them until the end. We'll come back to him 
And we are going to move now to the next writer, who is Joy Sri Chatterjee. So a few words about uh, Joy Sri Chatterjee. And this is in her own words, Joy Sri in first person. I have always loved to write and have, have done so since I was, I was in school in Bombay. When I was in college in Calcutta, I wrote for the Statesman, the Times of India and other newspapers and magazines. After that, I was in the Middle East where I wrote for the English language papers and short story for the BBC World Service. I have published a book of short stories where oleanders don't grow and a novel one step ahead. This is a comment at, uh, from me. I read a selection of, the, a selection of sh short stories where oleanders don't grow. And I'm not going to comment, you judge it for, uh, for whatever it is. Um, but I, I, can only see, I can only say that it was seven years ago, I still remember that. With that, I will unmute Joy Sri Chatterjee. So, Joyce, you are on. Thank you, Thank you Shubhuti. Um, this is a short story. It's based in the US. There's no place like home. A squirrel darted across the front lawn, stopped near the rhododendron bushes, and picked up a nut with its front paws. It sat up on its haunches and nibbled busily on its tasty meal, its beady eyes darting around as it ate. I stopped in the act of closing the front door behind me and gazed at it. I could feel my anxiety slowly ebb away. This is a sight that never fails to enchant me. I turned, opened the door, and looked into the house. Ma, I called, come, look at this. And I felt the tiny wave of misgiving wash over me again. My mother had not said anything to me earlier when I had told her that it was time for me to get back to work, but I had heard her unuttered reproach. But I don't want to be at home alone. There's nothing to do, no one to talk to. And the thought struck me now that what the elderly needed more than anything else was a live person to talk to, and nothing else could fill that need. My mother joined me on the porch and smiled when she saw the squirrel. Do you remember that time in Bombay when you brought home a squirrel and insisted on keeping it as a pet? You kept it in a shoebox. It ran away after a while. Ma, it was a chipmunk, not a squirrel. Yes, I do remember. Oh, it was a chipmunk. I wondered why these creatures looked so different. I've seen many squirrels over the past few days when you've been at work and I've sat out on the porch and never seen any people on the streets. That's what she told me when I came home from work, work on her first day in New Jersey. In Ranaghat, there's never any dearth of people on the streets, but here, there's no one. And sometimes those people even stop and talk to you, though they don't know you, I had added rightly on that occasion, trying my best to make her happy. I hadn't known then how much she was going to miss Ranaghat. But now my mother was talking again and the wistfulness in her tone caught at my heart. Even the animals in this country look different, she said softly. I sighed inaudibly and looked at my watch. I started in panic when I saw the time. I couldn't be late again today. I've got to get back to work, I said in a higher tone than I meant to use. Don't forget to lock the door when you go in and I rushed down the steps. I didn't wave goodbye. I didn't want to see the sadness in her face at the prospect of facing yet another afternoon all by herself. And then when I turned the corner and it was too late, I wished I'd waved goodbye. Sunday was a bright and cheerful day. We ate a sumptuous breakfast of luchi and alu torkari. Later in the morning, I changed into a sari and my husband and I took her to the Bengali club. I'd been looking forward all week to taking her there. I was sure that meeting other Bengalis would help lift her spirits. The first part of our visit went well. 
I was relieved and happy to see my mother talking animatedly to many of my friends. Then, later, as I walked up to where she was conversing earnestly with a group of people, I heard her say, do you know if anyone's traveling to India within the next two weeks or so? I want to go home. When we got back that night, I followed my mother into her room and the words spilled out of my mouth before I could think of what I was saying. It's not fair to me or to you for you to be wanting to go back to India so soon, I said. Have you forgotten everything we discussed after Baba died? There's no one to look after you in Ranaghat, and you're at a stage of your life when you need to be with someone who can take care of you. Oh, Ma, don't you see? There's no other way of doing things. And have you forgotten everything we had to go through to get your green card? I had to fill out pages and pages of paperwork. And then you and I had to go to Bombay because we couldn't get your green card at the consulate in Kolkata. I was trembling now, but we'd been so much in the past. I had made several trips to India because my father had sickened and then died, leaving my mother completely alone in India because I, their only child, lived in the US. My mother was equally passionate enlisting all the things about the Vanaghat that she missed. We finished the argument about two hours later, not just drained of emotion, but also completely exhausted. But I felt we had reached an unspoken truce. We would take the days as they came and not make any hasty decisions. The next two weeks went well. I came home at lunchtime every day and invariably found my mother sitting on the porch. It still saddened me to see her sitting there all by herself, waiting for me to come home, but she seemed contented enough. Then one evening when I returned home, I found her waiting for me at the front steps. Do you know Esther and George, she said, as soon as she saw me? Do I know who? Esther and George, they live in that house near the corner of the street. I shook my head. I don't think I've ever seen the people who live there, as I've told you. I know my immediate neighbors. I've introduced them to you, but I don't really know anyone else. That's because they only go out of their house during the day when you're at work, said my mother triumphantly. She was obviously taking childish pleasure in the fact that she knew one of her neighbors and I didn't. And all at once, the thought pleased me as well. The husband's old and doesn't see well at night, she went on. The wife's younger than I am and was doing fine till two years ago when she developed a heart condition. So now she goes for long walks every day, but late in the morning. She doesn't go out at night either. Tell me more about them, I said, feeling absurdly happy. My mother was beginning to take an interest in our neighbors. I was about to sit down on one of the porch chairs when she pulled at my hand. No, no, you mustn't sit down. They said to bring you over as soon as you returned. Her grip tightened. And so we crossed the road at once, hand in hand, my mother leading me along the way to Esther and George's house. The next evening, when I came home from work, I, in turn, had a surprise in store for my mother. It was a book and a brochure from our public library. My mother had always loved to read, and I had brought a box full of Bengali books back with us when she and I had returned to New Jersey. But voracious reader that she was, she had finished all the books in the first two weeks. I had then given her books written in English, but she'd refused to read them, saying that she wanted to read Bengali books only. I now decided it was time to try again. Our local library had a book discussion group that met every month, and I hoped my mother would join it. Actually, I had broached the subject during her second week in New Jersey, but she had been adamant in her refusal. She had reiterated that she wanted to read only books written in Bengali. But now that she had made friends with Esther and George, I took her a great books brochure and a copy of the book that the group would be reading next. But my mother refused to even look at the book. English is not a language that I enjoy reading, she said. But why not, I responded heatedly. It's not as though you can't read English. When you were in college, you had to write your BSc exams in English. And in India, I've seen you read magazines and newspapers in English. You could read this book and see whether Esther and George would like to read it too. Then I could drive all of you to the great books discussion, or the three of you could discuss the book right here. But I'm not interested in doing my leisure reading in English, she responded. 
The only books I want to discuss are Bengali books, and I can't talk about them to George or Esther. The finality in her tone made me realize that this was a battle I was not going to win. During the next two days, I kept wondering what to do. My mother would clearly be happier living in India, but would it be right to let her live on her own there? And how would I arrange for her always to have a cook and a caretaker? She couldn't do anything on her own anymore, but every attempt that I made to help her settle down seemed to end unsuccessfully. Meanwhile, we received a flyer from the Bengali club informing us of a play that was going to be performed by a well-known Bengali drama group that was visiting the US, and all three of us were looking forward to it. It was an excellent performance, and my mother sat spellbound throughout the whole program. After it was over, the audience was on its feet applauding, and when the applause died down, the main actor requested us to remain standing and to sing Dhanodhanya Pushvibhara with him. The response was instantaneous and overwhelming. Without being aware of what I was doing, I caught hold of my mother's hand and squeezed it tight. Then we both put our hearts into the words that we sang. Dhanodhanya has a special meaning for my mother and me. Years ago, when I was a child in India, I came home from school one day in a rare state of excitement. We had just started studying the history of the Mughal Empire, and I found it fascinating. Even the names of the emperors are poetic. I'd enthused to my mother, whom I always treated to a long discussion on what I had done in school. And I told her the names of the first two emperors. Do you know the names of all of them, all the famous ones at least, she asked. No, what are they? And she repeated them for me. And I made her repeat them over and over again till I knew them too and was almost chanting them because to me, they sounded like pure music. I told her so. There are other musical words in the world, she said. If you really want to listen to something enchanting, listen to this. And she sang Thono Dhanya for me. I had always liked the song, but now I found I loved the fervor which she intoned the words and explained the background against which they were written. My mother's immediate family had taken part in the freedom struggle, and she always talked to me about the years that led up to the events of 1947 with a passion that moved me. I felt that passion in her paraphrasing of the song. This world of ours is filled with riches, grain fields and flowers, and in its midst is a land that is the best land of all. It is fashioned from dreams and misted memories. It is the queen of all nations. It is the land of my birth. Her voice took on a soft tenderness when she sang two other lines, its inhabitants fall asleep to the singing of birds and awaken to the same melody. This is the soil that I was born on. May I die here as well. Since that day, she and I often sang Dhanodhanya together. Now, after the song was over, we slowly filed out of the call and got into the car. Didn't you enjoy that? I asked my mother after a while. Yes, she replied immediately. Then she became quiet. I looked at her with twinge of our knees and waited for her to continue, conscious that the atmosphere in the car was gradually becoming dense with unspoken emotions of a different, ominous kind. Suddenly, words burst out of her. It's such a betrayal, she gasped. We fought so hard for the freedom of our country, and now all our children decide to go live in the West. I didn't want you to leave India, but I told myself that it was your life and I shouldn't interfere. I never thought then that one day I would have to face the prospect of living you, with you in the West as well. I looked at her incredulously. Yes, you did fight hard, I agreed finally. All of you did, and you made great sacrifices. And you were just a flyer be proud of what you had achieved. But you never told me you felt this passionately about my leaving India. You did tell me that it was better to be a free to citizen in one's own country than to be an immigrant in someone else's. But you never voiced this kind of sentiment about it being a betrayal. And anyway, this is the US that we live in, not Britain. So why is it a betrayal? I took a long shuddering breath to study, study myself. Mark people have always migrated to places where they hoped to make a better future for themselves. The Aryans came to India from the Russian steppes. The Tagore family moved from East to West Bengal. And our ancestors, you yourself have told me, 
came to Bengal from Kannauj, a great weariness engulfed me. For the first time, I got the feeling that I was dealing with forces that were far beyond me. It was a couple of days later. I got up early one morning and looked out of the window. The beauty of a New Jersey morning in the summer filled me with the peace and happiness that comes from seeing a landscape that was one has claimed as one's own. The leaves of the red maple tree outside my window stirred languidly in the morning breeze, their elegant finger-like shapes softly caressing the clear blue sky. A copper beech with its very different shade of red stood solid, stolid and sentinel-like. On the right was a holly bush with its pointy, prickly leaves and associations with snow, crisp gold air and Christmas. Suddenly a red cardinal flitted by over the line of a hydrangea bush, the muted blues, pinks and greys of whose blossoms smiled softly in the early sunlight. And then the realization dawned on me that the same scene could look completely alien to other eyes. That sky was not my mother's sky. Those trees were not her trees. That bird was not one which she could instinctively claim as her own. That day, as soon as I reached the office, I made an important call. Then I rang my mother. I've got you booked on next week's flight back to India, I said. Ma, I'm going to let you go. Go home. Everybody, so I didn't see any questions um, on the panel, but um, we'll wait for a few minutes. So um, absolutely gorgeous, Jasri, and um, let me just uh, check one more time if there is something. Hmm. Something went wrong here. One disadvantage of this Zoom type thing. Yeah, I think I think I Zoom is. Huh? I, I think uh, what is happening here is we are in just a limited edition of Zoom now. Last time we did it, it'd be um, much expanded ed edition. I forget what that is called. I think that's. A, a broadcast uh, version. Broadcast version, version is much better than the one that we are using now. I think Arundamundir has made a change. They downgraded their probably their subscription or something. So that is why we are having a little difficulty difficulty to synchronize three different platforms. Um, but anyway, I think um, still so far I haven't seen anything. Again. Uh, again, our um, um, audiences who can hear me, please, if you have any comments on the, uh, on the writers that you have just heard, please provide your comments or write your comments on Facebook Live so that I, I can you know, collect them and pass them on to the writers. We would like to address them right now. If not, we'll wait for another few minutes. If you don't have any comments, in next few minutes, you can still ask the writers, um, you know, for any questions or any comments that you have at the end of the session. So, Bruto, I just heard from someone, you know, someone WhatsApped me that they can't get on to this uh, Shahid Talushana through Anand Mandir. So I don't know why. Well, um, they should go to Anand Mandir website and uh, click on um, Facebook Live. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's what uh, I I had told some people that that's what they should do, but I don't know why they are not able to get in onto this platform or whatever. I don't know. I mean, I couldn't have to WhatsApp Pelam. I just wanted to share. Right. Let me let me. Can you forward that to uh, Joy? Joy, I don't have. Uh, you don't have. I'll 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 tell him. Yeah. Let me check. Because Upol the comment. Upol this is this is Ambalika. This Umbalika. is Umbalika. yeah. Utpolda and Abby Gupta, another friend of ours, um, they made some comments, but they were finally able to join. 
Upalda um, and um, one of our another regular attendees um, um, and and um, and Abhi Gupta. Three of them. They were finally able to join. So, but let me check with um, Joy one more time. <clears throat> I think it's still showing me. Hello, Joy. Hey, Joy. Um, actually, by Facebook Live, the catch court chain. I'm complaining. Listen, Chira, na ki. Um, I'm going to see. Ja, kono ta kono dekha chhe. কখনো কখনো আমার পুরনো আমি যখন আরম্ভ করেছিলাম সেটুকুই দেখাচ্ছি তারপরে যখন কি হচ্ছে ঠিক বুঝতে পারছি না জয়শ্রী চ্যাটার্জি যখন পড়লেন তখন শুনতে পেলাম আবার ইট ওয়েন্ট ব্যাক টু দ্য বিগিনিং অফ দ্য সেশন এন্ড অনেকে কমপ্লেইন করছে ওরা কিছু দেখতে পাচ্ছে না এতে এটা হাতে নেই আমি আমি জাস্ট বললাম কিছু এখন হ্যাঁ কিছু করা যাবে ঠিক আছে পপ ভরদ্বাজ সুদীপ্তা এদের সর্বাণী হ্যাঁ ইউটিউবে যেতে বলবো কিন্তু তারা তাহলে আর কমেন্ট করতে পারবে না ঠিক আছে হ্যাঁ হ্যাঁ ঠিক আছে ঢুকো না মনোজ জয়েন করেছে দুটো কমেন্ট একটা হচ্ছে যে পুষ্পে ভরা meaning of it to your mother which has a resonant special resonance for her i don't know if you have ever read a slightly different but a story a very similar one by chitra banerji divakaruni called uh, mrs dotto writes a letter or something yes yes why i can't unmute you i can't shobai ki korte parchi but something is happening here we can't hear you can you unmute yourself yeah unmute yourself uh, issues she faces as she tries to adjust this is different from your story in particular in detail I mean, this is a younger couple has uh, children and all of that and you know the she tries to make a ujor ghar and you know there are all kinds of problems and the ultimate thing is she tries to have a clothes line and then <laughs> neighbors complain that oh. <laughs> it's worth reading and just a comparison it's not you know it's not the same thing but this is another case of a mother wanting to go home and what's the name of the book is it a, in a collection it is in a collection i janu na ki shoma je is that naam ta mone porche na naam ta mone porche na kintu you know google it you find it i think google it but i'll try to look for it i think it came out in the atlantic and since i am atlantic subscriber i might even 
go there to find it. But, Jai Sridhi, what I liked very much about your story, Bishon at a touch koreche, je, uh, we come from the same roots, we come from the same background, but something happens to us when we make another country ours. The trees, the, you know, what you talk about, you know, the, uh, you know, all the vegetation around, that is so dear to us because now we have accepted this country as ours. It is very difficult for... You know, it may take a while because, you know, when yes, I first came... Yes, it doesn't happen overnight. I thought, but once it happens, you know, yeah, you've accepted yeah. this country as your own. So then that becomes so much more familiar to you. I feel this now. When I go to Jamshedpur from where I come, it is a different world now. I was very much at home there. I never felt at home here when I came first. But now this is home and the trees here are what touch my heart more than the sal and the mahua. I, I, I'm, I am not able to connect with the sal and the mahua as much as I can connect with, uh, you know, yeah. dogwood. It takes a while, yeah. Uh, you know? So I, I found that a very, very interesting touch. And uh, that pain of losing that will never go from an elder's heart. I know my parents never wanted to visit me here. They would never feel at home, they said. Well, so I, I can appreciate that. Yes. Well, we live in multiple worlds, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I really thought that, that that part where you, that sense of betrayal that, uh, people feel when you come here, maybe many parents feel that, you know, maybe it's left unsaid that uh, you have abandoned the country. I think many, it's, many people feel that. I, uh, when you go back, they don't say it, but maybe it's there somewhere in uh, a lot of people, I think. Back of their head. In the back of the head, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I have been to India where people have kind of challenged me as to how come you can live there. This is years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a different. Yeah. yeah, anyway, we'll move on. I didn't see yeah, any yeah. Uh, comment except Utolda again said, why can't we talk? So that I cannot answer now. So, but I think no comments about the uh, story, uh, stories that were read. Um, could you tell Utpal that to write, or you did not? Yeah, he, he just wrote, why can't we speak? Mm. Uh, initially, he said that I cannot make any comment. I said, come send your comments to me. Then he was able to comment. He just said that, um, why can't we speak? And that I explained before. I'm not okay. going to explain again. <laughs> so um, anyway, um, somebody else texted me. Mosley Ahmed, I'm unable to... I, I'm unable to send comments. I liked Joyshree's Joy story very much. Thank you, you so much. So I'll say uh, Joyshree chat. Well, Joyshree can respond right now because she he can hear her. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, okay, just um, Joyshree say uh, um, says thank you very much in, in quotes. Then with that, I mean, Arikbat Chekkar or Nutun Kono comment Achikina, then we'll move on to Vishnu Priya. Um, I encourage them. I heard some comments. I, I saw some comments actually um, appreciating the stories and the session, but no, no, nothing specific. Okay, let me <laughs> let me go back. Yeah, we have some, we have some problem because it's the live still shows my my part of the session when we first started. Like that was more than half hour a half hour ago. It somehow it's not working well. So if I go back to okay, here we go. Now I can all right. So I'll go back and unmute myself from here. No, no more, no, no additional comments. Okay, I'll unmute others. 
Tathagat, un unmute your, um, yourself. So muting myself. myself. Muting myself. Yeah. Mute yourself. I, I meant, sorry. So um, we have, uh, so far we have um, heard Joystri Chatterjee and Tathagat Kosh and beautiful stories, different characters, but and different different themes but we are going to move on we uh, we were expecting a few more comments from the audience but we haven't seen any i know we are having some technical challenges uh, because people are unable to um, you know write their comments on the panel facebook panel um, you, and sometimes they are being disconnected, but you can go to YouTube live and watch the show, um, you know, show live. Uh, right. He will try and like get it. So I was saying, he would try and watch the herb. You can just mute. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, anyway, so I, you can go to um, YouTube Live. People who are not able to sign on on Facebook Live, you can watch us and you can listen to it. But unfortunate thing is you wouldn't be able to make any comments, but I encourage you to send any comments to me. My um, cell number is 732-331-4693. Again, the number is 732-331-4693. I will convey um, that to the respective writers and they would like to and and I'm, I'm hoping that we would be able to address them in the time that um, that um, that we have so with that I will move to Vishnu Priya uh, a few about a few words about uh, Vishnu Priya uh, Vishnu Priya is a bilingual writer specializing in poetry and short fiction Growing up in a family of academics devoted to the art of writing and performing, she naturally imbibed the inevitable teaching and writing. She finds these as the most rewarding forms of expressing ideas, impulses, inter interior mindscapes, and exchanging and analyzing viewpoints. With time, the entire writing process for her has morphed into a cathartic practice to voice the unsaid, the unexplored, and the uncharted realms of the everyday experience around her. She is also an avid reader and a creative thinker. She has published several poems, short fictions, and features in multiple North American and Indian magazines, webzines, webzines blogs, including her own. She is the proud recipient of the Gayatri Gamash Memorial Award for Literary Excellence in 2019. And for those who don't know what it is, it is a, um, an award annually awarded by Ananda Mundi uh, for writing excellence. And Vishnu Priya was the uh, most recent uh, recipient of, of, of that award. She has dabbled in broadcast broadcasting narration for documentary films, and script writing and hosting varied events. Vishnu Priya continues to be impacted by writers of all affiliations and ideologies who choose to write in English, Bangla, Hindi, or other languages in translation. She enjoys music, children's company, and daydreaming about becoming a better writer in not so distant future. She lives in New Jersey. Now, it, uh, now this is I'm switching. I'm adding some comments. She enjoys music. She and daydreaming about becoming a better writer in not so distant future. And the distant future is now, right? <laughs> we have you here. So with that, I'm, I I would just add that you know, as far as I'm concerned, I read her poems. I didn't read her short short fictions, but I read her poems. Quite a few of them. I've just it's just unique in sensitivity and streams of consciousness. With that, with that, Vishnu Priya, it's to you. Uh, thank you, Shubruto. Before I begin my short fiction today, uh, let me take this opportunity to thank Ananda Mundir and uh, Shahito Alochana 
for allowing me this platform, for giving me this very unique privilege to be part of this digital uh, communication with our readers, with our viewers, with our community at large. Uh, it's a very unique uh, opportunity. Uh, I have to say, I have to apologize that not many times I've been able to attend Shaita Lachana because it conflicts with my schedules on Friday evenings. But this is something I have been so blessed to become part of. I really thank you from the bottom of my heart. And to you, Amita Buddha, for approaching me and giving me this opportunity. Thank you so very, very much. Now that we are online, and I think this is going to, this trend is going to continue, you wouldn't have any excuses. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I look forward to more of these opportunities. I do. Yeah, I do. Uh, this story is called Stars and Stripes. It's a short fiction. And the background, I will not delve too much in detail, but just to give you a background, it is about the 4th of July fireworks and celebrations every year. <coughs> Stars and stripes. It wasn't raining, thank God, as they had predicted. So the fireworks were on. For the millionth time, the forecast had shifted to another day and time. Ever since Trina had come to the US, she had never missed the July 4th fireworks. It was a routine she enjoyed and looked forward to like a child. In the summer dark, the night sky, luminous with all the made in China beauties, made her smile inside. Never mind all that was in her head and heart, the prices she had paid to leave her familiar terrain and adopt another as her own. It had been all worth it. The parking lot in the adjacent restaurant hadn't filled up yet, so she was able to get a good spot. Wouldn't be difficult to weave out when the show was done. Last year, she remembered how it had taken a lot of her patience and the feel-good feeling which the show never failed to induce in her to get to Dean's Road via George's Road and then onto Route 1 North. It had been a good one-hour exercise for a regular 15-minute ride to get home. But it was fine, given the fact that her own township never had a display, cutting costs, she guessed, and this was next door and very convenient. She hadn't forgotten the patio chairs this time and also a sheet to spread on the grass. It was on the field between Crossroads North and Crossroads South Middle Schools where there was enough open space to accommodate not only the South Brunswick residents, but also those of the nearby townships. No surprise really, hearing so many languages coming to her from the different corners of the grounds, including her very own Bangla, considering that this huge township was extremely immigrant rich and had a lot to offer diversity wise. After the early closing today, she was able to grab some snappy dinner to come here and enjoy the cool breeze waiting for the dark to settle so the show could start. The kids were in a holiday mood with fries, popcorn, soda, ice creams. The older ones all huddled with their peer group far from the controlling voices of their parents while the younger ones caught fireflies in plastic containers and the toddlers watched on with admiring eyes while their older siblings blew soap bubbles all over the place. The rest entertained parents and strangers with their chatter. She loved this gay abandon every Independence Day. A pull she felt every year to come and be a part of these celebrations of a freedom that is missing 
almost non-existent in many parts of the world today because of short-sighted views, misguided zeals, and vested interests. Freedom was precious and certainly needed to be celebrated if you were fortunate enough to be living in a free country, not a gift to be taken for granted and wasted away. For Trina, fireworks were a great way to feel the free spiritedness of a child all over again. Rishi went looking for fries and popcorn while she settled on her patio chair. Let me go look for what's selling in those stands. She knew her husband. He was always hungry after dinner, as if that was the only thing to look forward to in the hours before going to bed. People had all kinds of habits, she thought indulgently. In the same spirit, she dug out some Bourbon chocolate cookies to munch on, looking around at the sea of faces. The dark came suddenly descending like a bat while the music in the background continued. It would soon start, but Rishi was somehow lost in the dark scene. Oh, he'll find me when it's time. She was going to focus on enjoying the fireworks instead, and he could do the same whichever corner he was in. But he was sauntering towards her right then with all the tempting, not so healthy fries and soda. Great, now she'd be tempted as well. This is what he always did, tempting her with food all the time while she tried her best to knock off some stubborn pounds from off her back and belly. But they were hot and unhealthy and she loved them and loved him for bringing them. She had to free herself from this dressing while she was here wanting to enjoy the freedom of the spirit. The fries were so good. Oh, forget the carbs and the cholesterol. She could overthink tomorrow. The fireworks began and surprised her like every other year. Oh, gorgeous. It's as if the sparkle was coloring her mind eye, sky, a heart. She clapped like a child and the contagion reached Rishi as well. They are all the same every year, right? No surprises. She heard Hindi and looked to see an old grandma in Salwar Kameez speaking to her graying husband, trying to hold on to a little child, trying to break free. Age is in the mind, she thought, not in the datedness of the fireworks. Surprise is a state of mind which has nothing to do with reality. How else could someone in the 70s feel like a child in the presence of a kid? There were two kinds of grandparents. Those who really enjoyed the lively companionship of their grandkids and became like them, or those who just babysat as a chore, complaining of sore joints. She would never want to be like the second kind, God forbid. Every year these kids drag us here. She heard the grandpa complain this time, even though the parents of the kids were around too, enjoying and not expecting much from the seniors except their company. What a waste of the celebration, she thought to herself, and wished she had chosen another sport to avoid these wet blankets, spoil sports. Can't enjoy a free fireworks show? What's wrong with them? Maybe only the Aurora Borealis would excite them. Or even then they would complain of the waste of a good night's sleep for a night in the open cold. Who knows? Complaining is also a state of mind. She was determined to ignore them and have fun and color while they lasted. The grand finale was awesome, predictably so. 
Some routines come loaded with the same excitement every year. No deviation, only looking forward to. She would have to wait for another year now. They were gathering their stuff and were preparing to leave when she heard a plaintive cry from behind them. Oh my God, can't find my cell phone. Could you please help me locate mine? Sure, Rishi was digging out his from his back pocket. What's your number? 732-555-9000. Rishi punched in the number while the man started combing the purple green grass at the first ring. And then the phone died without a blink. Zero, zero. Rishi's phone was all dark, darker than the sky now that the display was over. No one to her recollection looked more helpless, more desperate ever than this man with the lost cell phone. He had lost an essential part of himself. Could you please? He was pleading to Trina now. More helpless, more desperate ever than this man with the lost cell phone. He had lost an essential part of himself. Could you please? He was pleading to Trina now. Oh, helpless, more desperate ever than this man with the lost cell phone. He He had dropped it somewhere, a needle in the haystack, but it was somewhere he was confident. That wasn't much of a help, she thought, given the size of the dark field and the deserted grounds and the parking lot. The phone could be anywhere. All activity had now shifted to the traffic backup on Kingston Lane, with the cars trying to trudge their way homewards. Okay, let me try. And then eyeing him closely with Rishi as a bystander, she kept calling his number and moving with him all over to different corners, dark and unwelcoming the intrusion. She wasn't sure if all this wasn't some sort of a trap. She had to confess that she was a little uncomfortable, but decided to try until he gave up. And then after the 15th attempt, she heard an ecstatic, found it, it's here. Thank you so very much. You saved me, miss. Happy fourth to you, sir. Glad you found it. To you too, she saw his beaming face. She threw a prayer upwards in thankfulness that her cell had retained its charge. What a relief, truly. Also thankful that all her stupid apprehension was misplaced. Human nature had to be trusted always and not doubted without sufficient grounds for anything contrary. Silly me. And thank God we were of some help to him. Oh dear, we are so bound to our devices, lost without them completely, and also to our groundless suspicions and fears. There's no freeing ourselves sometimes. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, in the absolute dark, from behind the parked school buses, in the empty lot, emerged a teenage girl, alone, scared, on the verge of tears, trying her best to fight them. Hey, what's up? Rishi was concerned. Are you lost? She flashed a weak smile, so pathetic that all her attempts to look brave were useless. Yeah, I'm lost. I'm alone. All my friends left. And my mom isn't here yet. And I can't get her on the cell phone. I don't know anything around. I'm not from this township. Actually from Plainsboro. Oh, okay. Call her now, my dear. She'll be here soon. My cell phone's dead. Don't know what to do. Feeling a little weird alone. Also don't know the area well enough. Oh, goodness gracious. Another cell phone crisis in the span of a couple of hours? Unbelievable. These cell phones were 
three cell phones were dead by now already. What a lot of power the cell phone wielded. A bane and a boon both. Don't worry, my dear. Auntie will call your mom, chipped in Rishi reassuringly. What's your mom's number? Trina was wondering if her cell phone was the destined protagonist that night. The knight in shining armor to save souls from lurking disasters. Technology to save a man going into crisis mode and a modern damsel in distress. Hello, who's this? There was an unfamiliar female voice on the other side. One whose voice betrayed a lot of emotion, could have been a combination of nervous fear mixed with frustration and plain naked anxiety. You wouldn't know me. My name's Trina, just one of the many who'd come here for the fireworks like your daughter. My husband and I found her alone and clueless. Her cell phone's dead, so I'm calling you so you can speak with her. If you want, we can wait till you're here. Oh my God, thank you, thank you so much. We've been trying to reach Shriya, but couldn't. So very nice of you, if you can do that. Oh, certainly, no problem. Mom, I'm fine, no worries. Auntie will be here till you reach. And you can call herself if you want. Mom's on her way, she asked me to thank you for her. That's fine. So what's the lesson learned today? To be with friends till I got my ride? Yes, there's always safety in number. But before Trina could finish, Rishi jumped in with more suggestions. You know, never be in a dark place, but somewhere everyone can see you. Also try to look for the cops. The place was teeming with them tonight, all ready to help someone in this kind of a situation. They would have contacted your parents for you, you know. Trina could see relief writ large on Shriya's face. Yeah, never thought of that. Never been in a thing like this before. Yeah, we all have our first, right? They started walking back to the pier's parking lot with Shriya animatedly discussing her future school plans. She was going to be a junior in the fall and looking forward to a pre-med program in Temple or Drexel. She wanted to be a doctor someday, but wasn't a fan of all the hard work and long wait to become a successful pediatric surgeon. Oh dear, wishful thinking and inexperience, thought Trina, but was sure Shriya would soon get to know ground realities so why break her fantasies yet? She was free to dream big today, everything big today. Soon she would learn to love the unrelenting hard work to realize a dream. The worth of good work pursued for its own sake. That's what this country instills in you and rightfully so. Trina could see the broad stripes, the bright stars, the star-spangled banner in the sparkling eyes of this 16-year-old. After all, they were in the land of the free, the home of the brave, and could dare to dream to make almost anything possible. Dreams live here, waiting to wing and soar. Lovely celebration. This Independence Day was special, Trina thought contentedly as she headed home. Thank you. Very nice. And I'm glad it all took place on the 4th of July. <laughs> yeah, please un unmute yourself. So uh, let me check if there are any comments. Um, I actually invited the. Uh, it's it's good. 
there are only 15 or 16 people in the audience, so I have invited them to join Zoom. And one or two, Rupalda and uh, Bua, uh, you joined, but I think uh, the others are still on Facebook Live. But anyway. Um, Rupalda disappeared. Yeah, Rupalda disappeared. I think it, like, he must have turned off something. Um, but um, I did, yeah, I, I, I will again type in something just to make sure that we don't have any comments. Um, for the re uh, writers, we have listen to so far um, I did, yeah I, I, I will again type in something just to make sure that we don't have any comments um, for the re uh, writers we have listened to so far I is it who is who is talking joy we are having some difficulty any comments so far um, let's wait for a few more minutes minutes for com comments on the latest reading reading or we or otherwise we will open the concluding part Our we session. will, yeah. Q and A. Okay. All right. New comments. New comments. You know, uh, two thoughts. One is that let uh, Vishnu Priya read her poem. Yes, okay. absolutely. But well, then I can. Sorry, Amitabh. Thanks. Thanks for reminding me. I I just forgot. And the other I, thing, I just forgot the sheet. I'm so sorry. So yes. No, no, no worry. I'm going to be sorry. The other thing is that uh, when you are saying something, were you typing that in or were you reading this? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm typing in. I'm just typing oh, in. Okay. Just, I didn't quite know. Vocalizing it. All right. Back to uh, Shobha. Yes. Yeah. So that I don't forget what I'm trying to say. <laughs> just give me one second. Um, Mondira Chakraborty, Kuk Bhalo Laglo Shomadi. Um, um, Uddalak Bharadaj. These are the two comments for Vishnu Priya so far. Uh, oh, Shudipta Bua Chattopadhyay, beautiful Shomadi. That's all. Um, all but, right. Well, then we are beginning to at least, we broke the ice. All right. We broke the ice. We <laughs> Some broke feedback. The ice. <laughs> Some feedback, yeah. Yeah. Chalo, um, Shum, uh, okay. Vishnu so, Priya. Uh, yeah. Okay. So my poem is entitled uh, Topmost. Before I begin reading, I just need to give you a little bit of background. Recently, uh, everywhere, Facebook, WhatsApp, everywhere, this uh, suicide of Shushan Singh Rajput and so many other youngsters have been uh, di very disturbing. And uh, at the same time, uh, I'm not saying right, wrong, good, bad, nothing of the kind. But, you know, a youngster in his 30s committing suicide is is depressing for people our generation, our age, because these are like our kids. They are our kids' age. And also at the same time, George Floyd, you know, everything came together. And, uh, you know, there was a state of mind maybe or whatever. But I was uh, realizing that people are losing track of one particular idea. And that is success. Success comes with its own baggage. It, you cannot wish it away. You cannot push it away. So out of that thought, this poem came. It is called Topmost. I saw the crazy ant lift and pack the humongous peanut on its back. It could carry 20 times its slim weight without a complaint for the loaded freight. But this was way heavier than it thought. Had a long battle to win, having fought. It wasn't the climbing so much, but holding on for a firm clutch. Slipping, dropping, picking wasn't fun. 
But once in the race, you got to run. Till you climb the hilltop and plant your flag. While others at the bottom watch and lag. The air's thin at the top. Alone you see the drop. Proud, happy, whatever. None to share your fever. That's the reward or price. You've cast the fateful dice. All you do is breathe thin, far from the madding din. You are too high and further gone, only there is destiny's pawn that we'll drool and look up to, also greet with rave, rant, and boo. You've got to stand firm and complete your term. Keep away from the brain fog. You're no more the underdog. It's always lonely at the top. No space for the lesser to befriend. Win your race. Thank you. Yeah. I like that. Yes. Really like that. Very good. Very good. Unmute un 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 yourself. I there did. you go, streams of consciousness. So, uh, very beautiful. Um, um, Thank you. Sotagoto, you were saying something? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, I love that. Destiny spawn. Love that phrase. Destiny yeah. Thank spawn. You. Um, let me check the Facebook thing, and I'll be back in a few seconds. Any comments here? Um, no, uh, new comments too. Oh, again, Shudipto, very true, Shomadi, beautiful. Um, uh, Uddalak, Khub Shundar Kovita, Uddalak Bharadaj, and Shantosh Mukherjee sent me um, a text saying, saying um, Vishnu Priya's story is quite different and listening to her poem. So that's all we have for so far. We'll wait for one, one or two more minutes and see if there are any and additional we're comments. Talking only to ourselves. That's yeah. comforting to know. Just, just briefly, thank you to all those who commented and thank you so much for your feedback. Helps me understand my work better. Um, well, I, I want them to listen to what we are um, talking about so that. Um, that's why I didn't un completely unmute them. So, but that's why I have invited them to join the Zoom, I think, but I guess they're having some difficulty switching, um, you know, in the midst of the um, session. But anyway, so uh, last check on Facebook, last check on Facebook is no additional comments. Oh, um, there is one, one one comment from i think it's uh it's for um i think it's 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 for um vishnu priya Ujjwala, Ujjwala swaminathan that was a very wonderful short story uh the very wonderful short story captivating from start to finish i could relate to it would love to hear more of your stories Sheetal with mom and dad. It's for you. Uh, Thank you. Vish Vishnu Priya. Thank you. And Thank one you. additional comment that is um, again, Shushmita, Vishnu Priya, lovely. And Sharmani Mukherjee, love, loved your poem, Soma. That's all so far. So with that, we are going to move on to our last writer, um, Amitabh Bakchi. And we all know Amitabh Bakchi. I'm more popularly known as Amitabhuda, as if that's that's his last name, Amitabhuda. But, but, but anyway, I would like to again um, say a few words about him um, before he starts reading his piece. Uh, Amitabhu Bakshi is a physicist by training, physics teacher come engineer by profession. 
and a writer by choice and lifelong interest. He has writ written both political and non-political essays for the Statesman's, a Statesman newspaper of Kolkata, Dukul magazine, Shrangbad Bichitra um, of CAB, that is Cultural Association of Bengal, and assorted Anunda Mundir publications. He has written personal narratives and works of fiction for Anunda Lipi, again, Kollal's annual magazine, and the web journal, immigrantsbengalese.com, of which he is a co-editor. I would like to add a few more, um, if, if, if I can say a few more accolades to it. Um, Amitabh Bakshi, um, I'm sure many of you have read his uh, writings. And I, I'm, I, 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 I read a lot of his writings and I love them a lot. To add to the accolades, he is the ch chief editor of Ananda Mundir's uh, all literary uh, efforts, Ananda Shangbad and Ananda Lipi, both. And he's also the founder and co-manager of the Alochana um, in a program that we organize every month. So with that introduction, I would invite Amitabh Bakchi um, to read his piece. Amitabh, that to you. Thank you, Shubhrata. Let's see, I'm, I'm on mute, right? You can hear me. Yes. Uh, the story I'm reading, <clears throat> the title is this, The Sound of Silence. From her perch atop a bench on the levee, Mohini looks out across the river. It is the rainy season and the Mahananda is brimming. A quick downpour in the morning has left the soil firm without turning it into slushy clay. Gray clouds float in the sky, playing hide and seek with the sun. She surveys the scene on the opposite bank. There is the usual bustle of old Malda. People are hurrying to and fro, buying supplies at the bazaar. Shopkeepers opening shops and tradesmen plying their trades mingle with customers. Over at the ferry ghat, there is a constant stream of people buying their passage across the river to English bazaar. English bazaar, she smiles, what a name indeed the bequest of an empire receding into history. Hadn't Mohini seen all this many times before? She closes her eyes and feels at peace. Images of childhood float in her mind's eye. There she is, a slip of a girl in a light cotton frock, running by the river with Sneha, her best friend. They were wild in their own way, jumping on boats at, the rib at anchor when no one was around trying to keep their balance on the bobbing and sewing deck. More images of them jumping into the river near Station Ghat, where they both lived, ignoring parental admonition. This would surely invite censure afterward and the occasional thrashing. It all seems so pleasant now with the passage of time. What are you thinking, auntie? Rini's words puncture her reverie. She says nothing. What is she thinking anyway? A jumble of inchoate images flashes through her mind like a kaleidoscope turning at a frenetic pace. She looks instead at her niece. Rini is a pretty teenager who started college a year earlier. She just accompanied her aunt on a pleasant morning's walk. It was she who took Mohini to the levee or bund and settled her on the wooden bench. But now she feels it is time to go home. Could we start walking back, she inquires. Mohini does not reply. In fact, she cannot reply. Words have somehow deserted her, along with feelings and emotions, leaving her desiccated and confused. She follows instructions as a matter of routine, robotically, without interest or enthusiasm. She stands up at Rini's words and starts to follow her. The kaleidoscope in her mind has stopped spinning. It is stuck on an image, the image of a ravine next to the Tiratgar Falls, of a car that has plunged hundreds of feet next to the river, of the babble of rescuers' voices coming from below. Then her mind suddenly goes blank. It seems that Mohini's life had been preordained from birth to be difficult and unhappy. To begin with, there was the case of the stillborn calf. 
This is the story she has heard again and again with, about her birth, of which she has no recollection, of course. The day she was born, the family cow also gave birth, <clears throat> except that the calf did not survive. The family priest thought it was a bad omen. He suggested purification rituals, which her parents performed dutifully. She grew up in the station hut house till she was in her early teens. Then the family moved to Magdampur. Wherever they lived, the houses had one thing in common. There would always be an adjacent structure, a small shed or barn built of bamboo poles and bamboo slats and a makeshift roof of plastic or tarpaulin. This served as the living quarters of the family's milch cow. Not the same cow all the time, mind you. As a cow aged and her udders ran dry, she had to be replaced by an adolescent heifer. The aged dame was sold off discreetly to the friendly butcher. Every morning after milking, the milkman who doubled as the cow herd would take the cow out to graze in, on open fields. In the afternoon, the bovine yeah. routinely rest on her stomach in the ample courtyard, serenely chewing the cud. A huge shock awaited Mohini that day in the Magdampur house. She had come back from school and saw the cow resting on its tummy with its legs folded in a totally familiar posture, except that there was something unusual, even frightening about her. There was a large pool of a viscous reddish brown fluid that looked like blood on the ground right next to her posterior. Alarmed, Mohini ran to her mother and almost screamed, Mama, look here, what's that? Her mom was gentle, comforting, and evasive. Don't worry, there's some secretion that happens occasionally. The experience was helpful when Mohini started menstruating a few weeks later. She was shocked and scared, but was also somehow wise. She loudly called for her mother to help. Thus began her transition into adolescence on the way to adulthood. Things were going smoothly when all of a sudden calamity struck. Within a year of Mohini's leap into adolescence, her father succumbed to a massive stroke. He had not taken his high blood pressure seriously, like many people of his age, and paid the ultimate price. Mohini's elder siblings were barely adults then. Her mother felt scared, rudderless and adrift. Luckily for her, she had relatives nearby who helped her get back her bearings. But her focus turned quickly to marrying off her nubile daughter. Mohini had to give up her dream of finishing high school. With appropriate pomp, clad in a red Banarasi sari and to the dulcet tune of Sahanai, Mohini was married off to Sajal. The world was at war around them. There was constant talk of the Japanese coming to bomb Calcutta. Mohini was not even 16 years old. Sajal was an engineer who had graduated from the venerable Bengal Engineering College. He had found employment with a native prince, the ruler or raja of a native state in central India, who owed fealty to the King of England, but was nominally independent of the King's Viceroy in New Delhi. The princely state was in a remote area, ensconced in the low hills and steep ravines characteristic of the region. The area was heavily forested and had a majority tribal population. Mohini felt like a fish out of water when she first, first stepped into her new life so far away from Bengal. With few friends of her age and background, but with household help of plenty, the living was comfortable but boredom endemic. Her lonely spell was broken only when she became pregnant. True to tradition, she was sent to her mother's for childbirth. There, surrounded by the midwife and close family members, she gave birth to a healthy baby boy. He was named Rabi. Rabi was a couple of months old when his mother returned with him to the native state where Sajal worked. The baby was an instant hit. Everyone who came to see him spoke approvingly of his friendliness and playfulness. Two years went by. Rabi grew bigger. He started to walk and began to talk. The war had ended around the time when Rabi was born, and now the end of the British Raj seemed imminent. The nation's mood was happy and tense, looking forward to independence, but dreading the country's likely partition along religious lines. 
It all began with the boy being lethargic and having a low grade fever. This was concerning to Mohini, but not excessively so. Worries mounted as his fever persisted and he developed a dry cough. Concern turned to panic when Rabi's neck swelled up and he showed signs of breathing difficulty. A servant was dispatched to fetch the princess doctor post haste. The doctor looked at the boy's throat, examining it with a flashlight and showed it to the anxious parents. The throat had a thick whitish gray coating that was visible to the naked eye. The diagnosis was immediate. The boy had diphtheria. The treatment options, however, were few. As Sajal and Mohini heard in stunned silence, the only effective antidote would be penicillin, an antibiotic that had just appeared on the market in the major cities of India. The nearest such city where it might be available would be Raipur, and the parents were advised to take the boy to the main hospital there for treatment. Mohini's heart pounded almost audibly, straining to escape from the confines of her chest as she and Sajal changed from cars to trains and back to get to the hospital in Raipur. Rabi's eyes were shut all through the journey. His energy ebbed and slowly flowed away. By the time they reached the hospital, Rabi was beyond the point of revival. The apple of their eye was gone. Mohini was devastated. She blamed herself for not taking better care of Rabi, for not being able to protect him from the disease. She would break down sobbing at all hours of the day. Sajal's efforts at consolation were useless. More often than not, they served to increase her pain. The grief was compounded when after some 10 years of trying, Mohini could not conceive and give birth to another child. Mohini was in a deep funk. India was independent by then. The princely states were all gone and Sajal was inducted into the federal government's engineering service. His new job involved periodic transfers, which was helpful to Mohini for it involved changes of scenery and the setting up of a new residences. She also enjoyed her occasional trips with Sajal to his work locations, which were often in settings of astounding natural beauty. She did not accompany him, however, that fateful day when his job required him to go near the temple next to the lake atop the Tiradgar Falls. On the way back, uh-oh. Am I there? I suddenly lost myself. All right. Uh, she did not accompany him, however, that fateful day when his job required him to go near the temple next to the lake atop the Tiradgar Falls. On the way back, driving on a winding road, the jeep slid and skidded on soft earth. The driver lost control and the car plunged hundreds of feet into the river below. When rescuers reached the scene, there were no survivors. The news of the accident reached Mohini and she was driven to the scene in a daze. When she looked down on the ravine, at the battered jeep caught by a large boulder at the river's edge. She just shuddered and then clammed up. Thoughts and ideas got scrambled in her head. There was no wailing nor tears this time. Mohini simply stopped speaking. She had submitted to her fate, looked like, and become a mute observer of its workings. Sajal's death was a crushing blow, the last straw that proverbially broke the camel's back. Life goes on inexorably at its own pace. The last rites for the deceased had to be performed, as indeed they were. Mohini sat stonily through the ritual. Her elder brother Bimal had come from Calcutta for help. To find a sister who had gone silent, wholly without speech, was a shock. Bimal waited for the traditionally mandated period of mourning to end before broaching the subject to his sister. Would she be agreeable to accompany him to Calcutta for a change of surroundings? She indicated assent with a slight nod of her head. No words escaped her lips. All through the overnight train trip to Calcutta, Mohini wore a blank look. She ate and slept all right and wearily, wearily responded to directions, but had no energy to do anything else, least of all to speak. 
Things remain pretty much unchanged in Bimal's residence. Several months passed. Bimal was confounded, perplexed about his next step. Should he consign his sister to a mental hospital as his wife was pressing him to do? What was his moral responsibility? Friends and relatives came to visit. They freely offered advice and opinion. From these, a consensus slowly emerged. Send Rohini to Mohini to Malda, her childhood home, to be with her mother. Bimal liked the suggestion. Meanwhile, his daughter Rini came back from, his, from her first year in college and agreed to accompany her aunt to her grandmother's place. This morning, her mother is pleased to see Mohini and Rini walk back from the levee. Mohini has noticed the decline in her mother. Fingers curled by arthritis, the slow crab-like walk, the upper torso bent at an angle above the waist. But her smile has remained the same and her gentle embrace exudes warmth and affection. This house in the Singatala neighborhood is new to Mohini. Remarkably enough, as Mohini notices, the overall architecture has remained the same. There is still the milch cow, a new one, of course, and her bamboo and tarp shed abutting the residence. There's also a small courtyard between the U-shaped arrangement of rooms and a wall separating the property from the neighbors. Everything is familiar in a way that is highly evocative of Mohini's childhood, except that she still does not speak or laugh or show much of an energy to do anything. Her mother too is disturbed and confused. She has tried many things from singing lullabies and retelling childhood stories to cooking Mohini's favorite dishes and taking her out to visit old neighborhoods, all without registering visible emotion on Mohini's passive face. On this day, a small crowd has gathered in the courtyard around the cow. When she first arrived at Singatala, Mohini did notice that the cow's belly was distended, weighed down by the creature gestating inside her. The crowd that gathered today came to observe a live calf birth. Mohini is drawn near hypnotically, near hypnotically to the scene. The cow is lying on its belly on the ground. The calf begins coming out slowly from the womb. First the front hooves, then the legs nearly clasping the head, followed by the rest of the body, and finally the folded hind legs dragging behind. The calf lies limp on the ground. Is it alive? Mohini looks on with rising anxiety. Slowly, the mother cow rises and walks to her baby. She starts to lick the body, cleansing the slime that covers the newborn. The cuff stirs, slowly at first, and then in an ungainly, wobbly gait, tries to stand up for suckling and keeps falling down. Mohini, watching as if transfixed, begins to shudder uncontrollably. She lets out a primal scream. Ma, come over here quick. The calf is alive. Inside her, the floodgates of emotion have opened. Elation, a sense of pure joy overwhelms and nearly suffocates her. The kaleidoscope of images no longer whirls frantically in her head. The ravine next to Tiratgar Falls has been pushed far to the rear by the gush of her feelings. Mohini no longer has trouble forming words in her mind. She giggles and spits them out effortlessly. It looks to her mother as if a lifelong spell has been lifted at last. She joins her palms at an instinctive gesture and raises them above her forehead to thank the Almighty. Thank you. Thank you. Um, everybody unmute yourselves. Vishnu uh, Priya and Devojuti Da, unmute yourselves. So um, I love that the comments so far, two more additional comments. I'll wait for a few more minutes for uh, comments related to Amitabhada's reading. Then we'll just address all of them at the same time. And um, so let's wait for two more minutes. Let's and check if there are more comments. The Bhujuti charity to everyone. For very, for the, you can talk the Bhujuti da. Oh, enjoy good chilam. <laughs> no, uh, it's very fine presentations, very fine stories, of course. Amar Akta disadvantage, I am familiar with three of the four writings. Uh, Shudu Notun Shunlam Tafagotta, 
বাকি তিনটাই আমি জানি শুনেছি but they are beautifully presented today also readings were Absolutely. great i enjoyed Absolutely. it enjoyed it very much uh, while you guys talk ami arekbar check kori kono e ache ki na i i liked the way you know the calf so the nature in the form of a calf was what helped her to you know come back to herself again and start talking and living again I I think Amitabha it's the transference of motherhood you yeah. know mm-hmm. she is identifying her motherhood with you know the birth and mm-hmm. what joy she might have felt and what was taken away from her she can see that once again and I I guess that's what you know uh, it's the remembrance it's the memory of that joy which has been snatched away from her maybe that's what you know is so uh you know pressing on her that she you know expresses it right aman jeta puro program ta shune khub bhalo laglo je the four uh, stories are of distinctly different types kintu shobkotai in its own right beautifully written absolutely so so a few more comments and uh, not comments more like appreciation and, and adjectives uh, shushmita um, uh, fantastic amita bada shubhodev ab- absolutely gorgeous shudipto uh, bua darun amita bada and er pore hocche ami wait while we, st- we are still on the program jodi apnader kao if if you would still like to make more comments additional comments and we'll open it up for a q and a session for all the writers that that have presented so far for all four writers please feel free um the, to ask the questions that you have not asked so far so with that um uh, one or two comments that i just uh, picked up on ranjana channel soma darun uh, mundira chatterji or chakraborty khub bhalo laglo somadi mili bakchi more poem please <laughs> so next um, so we have some time we have a, um and uh, santosh mukherjee on phone he texted me um about amitabhoda's um uh, amitabhoda your story was very good and depict the post independent traditional bengali family wonderfully illustrated So I'm a, you heard me right yeah yeah okay yeah. so um and thank you i mean what can i say i know i know <laughs> so um i mean check but devabroto are you saying something okay you can unmute yourself yeah, devo to me on mute acha okay bro okay i'm so glad to join you here I'm okay. celebrating your uh, what should i say that uh, effort so much and achieving quality writing that's all for now let's see if we move further thank you okay thank you thank you thank you um let me check one more time new comment shom abhi ka ho ki tumhe ke sound of silence ghanta sunale padte সোমনাথ <laughs> 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 খুব আই থিং দিস ইজ দ্য ফার্স্ট ফিকশন দ্যাট আই রেড তো মানে নরমালি আমি নন ফিকশন পড়ি ভেরি নাইস আই ভেরি রিয়ারলি আই রাইট ফিকশন ইন দ্য সেকেন্ড ট্রাই ইজ ভেরি নাইস ভেরি নাইস আচ্ছা আমি একটা প্রশ্ন করতে পারি অ্যাবসলিউটলি অ্যাবসলিউটলি আমার মনে হলো যে জয়শ্রী বিষ্ণুপ্রিয়া এবং অমিতা বো देयर রাইটিংস আর এট লিস্ট পার্শিয়ালি बेस्ड অন লাইফ এক্সপেরিয়েন্স লাইক থিংস দ্যাট ইউ হ্যাভ experience themselves kintu tathagotta seems like 
is totally, uh, you know, to total fiction. Is that right? 